Lawmakers approve more spending and Chicago's top cop gets fired. We'll talk about it next on Capitol View. Good evening, and thank you for tuning in to Capital View, the show where we talk about Illinois politics and government. I'm your host, Jamie Dunn, with Illinois Issues and NPR Illinois. And with me today is Matt Porter with WCIA. Matt, thank, glad thank you're you. here. Nice to be here. And Bruce Rushton with the Illinois Times. Bruce, Thanks glad you're me. back. So we've got a lot to cover today. We're going to start at the state government level, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's going on in Chicago. Uh, Matt, you were covering all the action this week. The leaders and the governor sat down for a meeting. Uh, it turned out to maybe be much ado about nothing, but uh, give us a little overview of what happened. Well, it, a meeting happened, and I guess in that sense of the word, that's progress, at least coming from Senate President John Collerton. He said he was happy that there was a meeting, and another meeting has been scheduled. As for what really happened, I mean, we didn't really see. We know apparently workers' compensation was talked about, according to Christine Rodonio, extensively. Um, but whether or not they've made any progress, it doesn't seem likely. The meeting in private was less than an hour. Um, they came out and essentially said that we're now going to send our staffs in and you know maybe some more of the gritty legislative work is going to happen next week and as we approach the new year but really if anyone's expecting some sort of grand bargain or compromise to come out of you know last Tuesday I think you're sorely disappointed and I think as President Cullerton again said right after the meeting he doesn't expect any budget bills to be floated about until after the new year when they no longer have that you know three-fifths majority needed to pass the bill they can pass it with a simple majority. But the House did go on to approve a few bills this week. Uh, one of them is a spending bill. It would uh, put, pass through money to a lot of different uh, things in the state that the money is already around for, so it's not general revenue funds for the most part. Uh, Bruce, what's going on there? What did the House approve, and what does it mean for the overall budget progress? Well, I think this is more hostages released, if you will. I mean, this is money uh, for more fuel taxes that are supposed to be going to cities, uh, money so that lottery winners can be paid. Uh, help me out, there's a, or a couple other things, but these are... Yeah, money for uh, low income, assistance for... For heat, heat yeah, yeah. La heap, la heap. That, yeah. that was actually fairly significant. But on the whole, this is money that's been held, again, hostage. These are in special funds that are supposed to, that for whatever reason, the money hasn't been released. And the thing that might happen, I think, is that this helps continue the status quo, which is up in the air. Uh, this, I think, uh, relieves some pressure to actually get a budget bill done because uh, now, okay, well, now the governments are getting, local governments are getting the money to which they're entitled. I don't know whether gaming fees are, are part of that or not, but I wouldn't be surprised to see those released at some point, too. And the longer this goes on, where, okay, well, we'll just keep things just going along. The government isn't going to be sh isn't going to shut down entirely. We'll just keep middling along. That doesn't portend well, I think, for a budget bill to actually be reached and be signed by the governor. On some level, I think you're better off having the government shut down and just, okay, do something now, not later. Don't kick the can down the road. Make some decisions and get something done. That's not happening. And so I think who's going to be really nervous in this sort of thing might actually be higher ed because there's no money right now for higher ed. And that they might end up being the last person standing in the game of musical chairs here in terms of getting the money released. And so, uh, yeah, it's a step forward on some level, but it also could be a step back. Well, and social services groups also, a lot of them waiting for funding um, that hasn't been approved. Mm -hmm. Matt, a lot of lawmakers kind of grumbled about this as they voted yes. What was the atmosphere as this was going through? Well, you know, the Republicans so far have been opposed to sort of any sort of general revenue funding while there's no budget or revenue to back them up. So I think this vote for them for a small part of the bill it's kind of went against that principle of, you know, passing revenue, passing spending without revenue to balance it out. But overall, this bill, like the federal pass-through bill they did a few, uh, maybe a month ago, all the money is there. It's sitting in funds. It exists, and it's just a matter of sending them through the authorization to be spent. So I think for everyone, if they gave any sort of grumble, this was money that's just sitting there, and it's a matter of, again, passing it through. The question is, like uh, Bruce says, when you get to higher education funding and all the other money that's not there that needs to be spent and needs to be raised by the state, you know, 
when is that money going to be decided? Um, higher education especially is a big issue. You know, we saw Richland Community College here locally saying that they're canceling their adult education program. They're canceling another program, laying off 11 people for the spring, and that's because they haven't received a penny since the beginning of July. And it's going to be, as we see that go forward, how, mi how much more damage is that going to do? Yeah, and I think probably University of Illinois of the world will be okay. I mean, they have sufficient reserves. They can probably weather this through. But it is going to be the Richland Community Colleges, the smaller institutions, that are really, you know, faced with the prospect of some hard times here unless something's accomplished. And Richland said that they're not paying for MAP grants in the spring. That's huge. I talked to one student who's on the MAP grant funding. You know, now he's got to maybe get a part-time job at night to support his family during the day and also go to school so he can get that electrician's degree for example, and get the higher wage jobs so that he can get off government assistance entirely. It's going to have a major effect on the smaller schools going forward. Well, and we saw this spending approved after countless news stories covering a lot of these issues, especially the lottery was a very high profile uh, case that lottery winners weren't getting paid. Bruce, when are we going to maybe see that same groundswell happen with higher ed and, uh, for instance, these MAP grant students? Are, are we going to see a chorus of these stories and the pressure coming forward? We've seen a chorus of these stories, and there has been pressure. And, for example, on the part of local governments, that had been swelling for some amount of time. You had one local government, uh, it is, the name escapes you, we're going to shut down, shut off your power here, not here in Springfield. But it got to that point where folks were grumbling, and they were putting the pressure on their legislators, you know, to say, hey, we need give us a gas tax money. It's ours. It doesn't belong to you. And so that's been alleviated for some, you know, to, to, to some extent with this with this release. I mean, the lottery is, is self-explanatory. People weren't buying lottery tickets because they weren't going to get paid. Um, so that was, that was fairly fundamental. But with, you know, these other things, higher ed, social services, they don't have that kind of groundswell, I'm not sure. I, I don't think. I mean, the social service agencies have been make, raising a stink about this for some amount of time. Drug courts are one example of it. You've got folks, the cops have been raising uh, uh, concerns about money for training, that sort of thing. That hasn't been addressed. And so I am, you know, folks keep saying, well, once we get to January, we all we need is a simple majority. Well, last May, all we needed was a simple majority. What has changed? I'm not seeing anything that's changed. You know, this meeting that they had with the uh, 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 leaders, that to me was, uh, frankly, I'll, full confession, I didn't watch it because I saw no reason to watch it. It was clear to me, at least, that it was just a bunch of kabuki theater that was going on. And uh, as I've lightheartedly told some folks, what they should have had is they should have had a facilitator slash therapist in the room. And what that person should have done is turned to Christine Redonio and said, Christine, you've been in the legislature for a long time. You know Mr. Cullerton. You know Mr. Madigan. Please introduce these people to Mr. Rauner and tell them a little bit about them. And that sort of fundamental stuff because these people have no working relationship whatsoever. Uh, and at the end of the day, they should have locked the door to the room. And when they went to get out, guess what? You're stuck here. Because there is no reason that I can see that there's been any fundamental movement anywhere. The governor apparently is still saying, I want the farm, the store, the whole shebang. And he's just not, at this point, going to get it from what the Democrats are saying. You know, and the lottery was such an embarrassment for Illinois. It, you know, it made national headlines because people in other states were just like, look at Illinois, you know, they're selling lottery tickets, but they can't pay the winners. I mean, that was a, that's one of the reasons why it got headlines. It's unfortunate that these other important cases mm -hmm. don't get those headlines. Mm -hmm. And when I talked to someone who was watching this debate closely, you know, they said to me, it's gonna take maybe someone to die because of these budget cuts or, you know, to make the headlines and put the pressure on someone to actually get things done. I don't, I hope to God that that's not true, but you look at how much pressure has been on these people for MAP grants, for domestic violence, sexual assault, lie heap, and it didn't, none of that seemed to build any sort of pressure to encourage the legislature to get a budget done in any sense of time. I think lie heap actually is a good example. Guess when it got passed? Oh, winter's winter. here. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, this is, this is, you know, this September of our years, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, and LIHEAP has started um, off with federal money, but it would have mm -hmm. run out come probably end of December. So it's a good point, Bruce, that it's kind of when things are actually coming to fruition that it's making people move on these uh, on these bills. So the speaker, of course, held a press conference uh, after uh, the meeting and talked a little bit about uh, his thoughts. Matt, he uh, was asked about the primary and said uh, that he's too busy to pay attention to that right now. I don't know if we buy that line, right. but uh, you looked into uh, <laughs> who's filing and what's going on with primary races. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, yeah, I took a deeper look at the filings now that they're all said and done, and we have more than 40 contested primary races 
um, for March. That's um, from experts I talked to, not necessarily a record, but it is a large number of contested primaries for an election year. Um, and the thing is, the budget debate is still going on. This should have been wrapped up six months ago, and now you've got lawmakers who are going to have to make very tough votes, um, especially when you have Bruce Rauner saying he wants term limits, he wants redistricting reform, he wants a property tax freeze with local control, he wants these things to get voted on. Um, those are tough votes for people who might be in close races with either their primary candidate or they're looking on to the general um, and maybe don't want to cast a vote you know, against local control or for local control. Um, and I think that's going to make, when they do come up to a budget, the math even more difficult because we know the negotiations part of it is who's going to vote for this, who's not going to vote for that. You know, this person's in a close election. This per and with so many contested elections, I think that math's going to be harder to do, especially knowing the House and most of those contested races are Democrats, has such a razor thin supermajority to begin with. Well, and the way that the districts are drawn in the state, we've talked about this on the show before, the primaries are often actually the race because the district will be so Republican or so Democratic that the general election is, is not much of a contest. Bruce, are we going to see uh, lawmakers perhaps wanting to put off these tough votes past the primary, <laughs> past <have>. November? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there's nothing like an election to, 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 to get folks to be serious and makes to take some tough votes. I mean, these primary elections, I don't think, are going to help anything. I mean, the time to solve this was last year. Everybody knew that. And so, you know, there's, it's just going to make folks, I think, less willing to, you know, get out of their foxholes and, and take some tough votes. Uh, it doesn't shape up well at all. Uh, you know, I'm not sure to what extent. We know the legislative leaders hadn't met since May. I'm not quite sure what degree uh, their staffs have been meeting because, you know, all this stuff should be, all the scut work, so to speak, should be done by the staff. Folks like Madigan and, and, and Rauner and Cullerton, they don't know the details and the minutia of this stuff. That's stuff that's done by their staff. The question to me is how much, you know, how, how much of those guys meeting, how much are they exchanging? I don't know that anybody necessarily knows that. But, you know, that nothing's going to happen until those hard minutia, those kinds of, those kinds of, that kind of hard work is being done in the trenches. And so, you know, even then, even then, I mean, there's no question that what needs to be done, and this has been no mystery to anybody, you got to raise revenue, you got to reduce expenses. And there's no easy way to do that. And the longer you put it off, the deeper the hole gets. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, would it be, when are we going to get a budget? What happens if it's not, into, what happens if May comes and we don't have a budget? You know, who do you blame it on? Because both sides have plausible deniability. And both sides, I think, probably care more about perpetuating their power, what power they have, than anything else because they believe they're right. I'm interested to see what happens when we get to February and Bruce Rauner has to give a budget address and if we still don't have a 2016 budget of what he's going to say. Well, you know, what do you say at that point? He could do the traditional thing and ask for more time. I mean, <laughs> but, you know, he gave his budget address last year, uh, which was smoke and mirrors. I mean, he had a $2 billion hole in it. Right. And so he's not, you know, he's painting the, the Democrats as being, you know, the irresponsible folks who won't pass a balanced budget. This has been said before. He hasn't presented a balanced budget. And, you know, I keep harping on this, but one of the re things they have to do before they, I think, really get to the, you know, the, 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 you know, the short hairs on this one in terms of a budget, is they need to figure out the tax question. You know, and they want to do that secondly. But you can't figure out how much, how are you going to spend money until you figure out how you're going to collect it. And no, everybody wants to put, or at least Rauner, he wants to put that second part first. And Illinois, if nothing else, has an antiquated tax system that needs complete revision. Even the governor said that, but that's what they want to hold on to. That's what, that's what he wants to do last. And I don't understand that logic. Well, and another vote that took place this week um, that's maybe not grabbing as many headlines, but the House approved changes to the um, uh, unemployment insurance program. And Matt, this was something that the governor did want to see happen. It's mm -hmm. kind of low-hanging fruit for sure, but it is something that was on his agenda. Um, how, how does that move the ball forward? Well, unemployment insurance, this was a deal that was crafted by business groups and unions outside of the House and then basically submitted as a framework. And I think people said this is how maybe Bruce Rauner gets this non-budget agenda across, is having the interest groups outside work together first, come to agree to some sort of framework, and then bring it into some piece of legislation rather than trying to maybe ram it through the legislature. And so, yeah, it was low-hanging fruit and something that both groups could get on, 
But again, maybe Bruce Rauner can learn from this and say, this is how, if I want to try to have meaningful change with workers' comp or tort reform, this is how I should start it, rather than maybe doing this workers' comp or else or no budget, which really we haven't seen work yet. Well, I want to move on to uh, city news now. As uh, most folks out there probably know, if you've been paying attention to the news, the Chicago Superintendent of Police was fired this week after the fallout uh, when the city was uh, ordered to release a video of a police officer shooting a teenager 16 times. Bruce, um, you have covered police cover-ups, lots of uh, you know police corruption and, and things in the past. What are your thoughts on uh, what happened in Chicago and, uh, <laughs> I know, getting you started, but, and also the uh, <laughs> Superintendent McCarthy's uh, resignation? Well, first off, it, this isn't about just the police. This, to me, is an epic monumental failure on virtually every institution that exists in this state. Let's start out with Laquan McDonald, the, 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 the kid who was killed. He was a ward of the state, so his family failed him. Uh, he was uh, apparently reportedly sexually abused in not one but two foster homes. So the state social systems, social services systems failed him. Then he shot on the street uh, 16 times. So, and then the police did nothing. I mean, they're walking past his body. They're not trying to help him. They go and they're reportedly erasing a surveillance tape from the video, or surveillance uh, video from Burger King. So the police fail him, clearly. Then the media fails because they accept this press release, this statement saying he was shot once in the chest. It came down to independent, virtually, freelance journalists that nobody's heard of to request the uh, autopsy report that shows he, no, he wasn't shot once in the chest. He was shot 16 times all over the place. So that's the media failure. Then the media failed again because they tried to request, uh, they did FOIA requests for the video, and when the cops said you can't have it, they just went away. Thank God for Brandon Smith, the uh, freelance journalist who actually sued to force that be released. The city council failed. They approved a $5 million settlement with no public debate about it to the family just before the election. The city council failed. The mayor failed here because he says, I never saw the video. I have plausible deniability. If you didn't see the video, then I, who knows? I mean, you have an obligation as the head of that city to watch that video. So the mayor failed. The state's attorney failed. The state's attorney waits until a judge orders a video release. Well, okay, now I'm going to charge him with murder. So the state's attorney failed. The federal government failed. You have this litany of problems with the Chicago Police Department from Berg, the torture cases, going forward to the African-American suspect dressed up in antlers with cops standing over and posed as hunters. You have of last year, the Chicago police played Sweet Home Alabama over a police loudspeaker radio during a peaceful protest uh, about police brutality in Chicago. You have a commander, Evans, who is now set to stand trial. He, re he has allegedly put, stuck a gun in a suspect's mouth, and he was promoted all the way through the ranks despite dozens upon dozens of complaints. And where is the Department of Justice? Where is the civil rights investigation? Folks now are saying two things that I think are deeply disturbing. One, is it possible that Rahm Emanuel's uh, uh, close relationship with Barack Obama might explain this lack of a federal investigation? It's a reasonable question, I think, to ask, given what's happened in Chicago and much smaller events that have triggered civil rights investigations in other cities. So you've got, you've got that. It, it is just a, a stinky, stinky, stinky mess. And you, the other thing that is, I think, deeply disturbing about this is I've been reading some of the commentary uh, on New York Times, for example, and there is a school of thought out there saying, well, don't be so hard on Rahm Emanuel, you know, because who else can fix this city? You know, he, he's, he's the only guy that's up to the task. You, how many people live in Chicago? And you've got just folks saying, well, if we don't have Ron, we have nobody? Uh, it, it, it's enough to leave someone, I mean, speechless, really, to some regard. In Ferguson, uh, and this is going to sound awful to say, in Ferguson, this, the Department of Justice stepped in and things changed. And the same thing happened in Baltimore. Things changed. They rioted in those cities. Is that what it takes? Do you have to burn and loot? before the federal government steps in and does its job. Uh, it, is, it is just an epic, epic failure on every level, and nobody's hands are clean. And one would hope that is not what it takes, but there are, one would hope that. There are state uh, folks and 
uh, presidential candidates calling for the Department of Justice to intervene. At first, the mayor was opposed to that. Now he's saying that he thinks that may be a good idea. Matt, what's going on as far as that investigation and who's asking for that to happen? Well, I'm unfortunately not as familiar with this issue, um, but I can tell you that I think a number of groups are going to start looking at this. In the, and if the mayor and especially if other candidates are starting to get involved, there's going to be more attention. I think the federal government is going to have no choice oh, I think they but have to, to now. look at this now. I think they have, but it's, it's a case of Johnny come lately's. You know, we have Lisa Madigan standing up finally saying, geez, feds, would you come in and do this? You know, where was she? Where was she and other folks? Because she, she's not alone. Where were all these folks who are elected leaders through all these years? And I forgot to mention also the uh, person in the uh, Department of, uh, of Independence, supposedly the, the, the division that's supposed to investigate police shootings, says that he was fired because he refused to re uh, reverse his decision saying that some officers involved shootings were not justified. He said that on the record. And still, you got somebody like that on the record. He's a former police department employee. He's been saying that for months. And nobody's paying attention until finally now. Do you think there's something specific about the culture in Chicago that has allowed this con to, to continue the feeling that, well, this is just the way things are done? I think that, that there's, I mean, I draw the analogy of the frog in the water as the water heats up. I mean, I can't imagine this sort of thing happening in many other cities to the degree that it has in Chicago. and people just saying, okay, well, that's just the way it is. And that seems to be, somehow, that's just the way it is in Chicago. Uh, maybe that is the case. But it, the, the, the things that have happened, you keep, th you know, as I've been watching these sorts of things unfold, because I try to pay some attention to it, I just keep saying, nah, I couldn't get even, nah, they can't be worse than that. They, what's going to top this? And it just keeps topping itself. Um, you know, the, the, this, the well-known stories about John Berg and his, and, 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 and his Burge, I may have been pronounced that, and his torture cases. You know, that, that, you know, five, what is it, $520 million paid out in the course of 10 years to settle police excessive force brutality claims in Chicago. That's $142,000 per day that the city of Chicago has been paying to handle complaints against its police force. $142,000 a day. It's mind-blowing. That, and mind-blowing that it's that amount of money and still the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice hasn't said, hey, let's take a look at this. Well, and I'm sure we will be revisiting this case um, in, in future episodes of the show uh, as things progress, uh, but I'd like to move back to the state level now uh, to talk a little bit about the newest representative in the House, uh, Sarah Wojcicki Jimenez, was sworn in in the 99th district. She is taking the spot of Raymond Poe, a longtime lawmaker who moved over to the Department of Ag. Matt, can you tell us a little bit about Sarah? She's been around the State House for a while. Uh, a lot of folks uh, recognize her who have been working around right. the State House. Right, she's been a staff member for several different people, including a Democrat treasurer, I believe. Um, and so she's worked for both parties. She, um, I think she's, and she knows a lot of people in the State House, and she definitely understands. Springfield's um, situation with the amount of state workers involved um, and I think she's going to be a pretty good fit um, as far as Raymond Poe was someone who could flip on certain votes uh, and join the Democrats and I think um, Sarah is someone who um, fits sort of the Raymond Poe mold but how she'll be challenged um, in her primary and then in her um, general election we'll see if someone more conservative um, again trying to take that seat. Um, it's going to be a very difficult seat to hold maybe because she's new and not as many people know as much about her. Well, of course, she has close ties to the governor and uh, yeah. most people feel the governor probably weighed in on this decision. Bruce, you what are think? her connections <laughs> to the governor? I believe <laughs> we've talked about uh, her previous job and her yes, pay level Yes, I mean, she was the uh, governor's, uh, governor's spouse as the first lady's chief of staff. I would call that close ties to the governor. I think it's probably a safe bet that if she needs some money, she's going to get it. Uh, the thing that's kind of puzzling to me, moving away from the politics of it, and I think that she is fairly well known around here. I mean, she did work for WICS uh, television. She's She's a familiar face uh, uh, to, to folks. She was on the Springfield Park Board mm -hmm. as yeah, well. Yeah, she yeah she was on the Springfield Park Board, so she's 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 known. Um, the thing that's curious to me is that on the surface she's taken a pay cut of something like thirty thousand dollars a year. Uh, she was making $100,000 a year as uh, uh, the chief of staff for the first lady. Now the starting pay for labor, the, the flat salary is something like 67, 65. Yeah, 65, 67, something like that. I mean, that's a lot of money to give up. I mean, are they going to make her assistant whip to the assistant whip and, and, and 
can hang titles on on her to kind of make up the difference, or is she going to keep the per diems that some of the other legis local legislators give up in view of the fact that they're uh, uh, living here in Springfield? Who knows? But the money part of it is, I mean, it's ancillary to a point, but it's also interesting to me. I'm also curious, who's going to be the next chief of staff for Diana Rauner, um, and what will that person get paid? That will be interesting to watch, and I'm yeah. sure uh, we will all be watching for that. So we've just got a few minutes left. I wanted to touch on one final topic. Uh, the governor has come out and, and said that he does not support, at least for now, Syrian refugees being placed in Illinois. Uh, the Obama administration has tried to reach out to the governors who do not support those placements and said that they'll give uh, the states some information on the refugees that would be placed. Matt, what was the governor's response to this? Tell us a little bit about what's going on. Well, the governor um, said he participated in the call with the president and that um, it was a very understanding call and they're starting to work with the refugee um, situation. Uh, the president, obviously the governor says, he thinks the president is working to deal with some of his concerns but the bottom line factor here is governor bruce rauner doesn't have a whole lot of say when it comes to refugees in illinois even if he were to stop uh, programs to help refugees in illinois and they weren't to settle here i mean refugees in the united states are going to move across states back and forth freely i mean it's just the way that the united states is set up and the way we work with refugees is more from a federal government interaction rather than states. So the governor may not want to see more Syrian or Iraqi refugees in Illinois, but the bottom line is there's not a whole lot he can do about that. And I think this is now going to be, well, the president is dealing with many, many governors, 30, 40, almost 40 governors who are concerned. How does he deal with their concerns? But also he is the leader of this country, uh, the executive officer, and he really makes the decisions on, on this issue more than the governors. We've just got a few seconds left. Matt, the Senate expected to come back and vote on that appropriations bill? They're expected to come right back on Monday. There were some questions of whether or not they would come on the first day of Hanukkah, but they are going to be back on Monday. They should pass that lottery gas tax bill, LIHEAP. That should pass overwhelmingly, and um, we should see that go and be signed into law before the end of the month. Well, and we'll have to leave it at that. I'm sure uh, f folks that are on next week will be chatting about that. I'd like to thank my guests, Matt Porter and Bruce Russian. I'm your host, Jamie Dunn, with Illinois Issues, and we'll see you next week on Capital View.